welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, I'm joined by not only Derek from Myth Vision Podcast, but the special guest, Dr. Dennis McDonald. And by the way, I got, we have a huge announcement for this for this stream right now. The book is out right now, and um, synopsis of epic tragedy and the gospels by the way right now the the price just dropped down for a limited period of time it's normally 45 74 and it's right now just we don't even know how long it's going to be a day or two maybe it's down to 1848 I, I actually just ordered a copy myself Derek already has one as you can see yeah I well, just, mine's over there but same thing yeah yeah i just ordered one right before we started the stream because of the price drop so it can for, before we even start doc dennis can you tell us why this book is important and what is what is this book at all what is it it is my contribution to the culture wars over religion and it's the result of 20 uh, years of uh publishing actually 40 years of research and it includes uh, all, all the most important contributions I am, am able to make that relate Greek poetry and to some extent philosophy to um, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. This is actually a reference work. So I encourage people to buy it and to read the first 20 pages or so and to use the rest as they would a, a phone book or an encyclopedia and to look up the various passages. And it's actually three volumes in one, Neil. The first one is on the Synoptic Gospels with my reconstruction of Q. It also, then the second volume is on the Acts of the Apostles and its um, imitations of Greek poetry and the Platonic Socratic dialogues. And the third is a comparison of the three strata that are likely for the composition of the Gospel of John and its relationship to Euripides' Bacchae. So the, it's cherry picking about 10 different books and uh, scores of articles that I've written on this topic. Mm -hmm. And it's intended to be a representative of my life's work. It's more a reference work than it is an argument for my position, though there's a follow-up book that I'm writing right now, which is an argument defending the methodologies I use for uh, not only comparing the Gospels and Acts to Greek poetry, especially to Homer, but uh, also to uh, emphasize uh, the uh, recovery of the, gospel, the, the lost gospel cue. Uh, I use different methodology and have a cue that's about half again as long as typical cues. And uh, in my opinion, is the most important single document witnessing to the historical Jesus that is uh, has a, a read on Jesus that's different both from the Synoptic Gospels or Acts uh, or, or John and Paul. And um, I, I'm glad to talk about any of it, but I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. I'm proud not only of my work, but of uh, Chris Crawford, who's the technician who helped put this together, to my brother Peter, who's a linguist and a Hebrew Bible scholar, and um, who is able to uh, do technical assistance. And also, too, I appreciate Amazon. Um, for publishing the book. I've had to create my own press in order to get this out because commercial presses um, and academic presses have rejected it. I tried to get it published by uh, almost 10 different, uh, I think eight different publishers, and uh, they all rejected it because it was too long. They didn't think there was a sufficient market for it. And I really think they're wrong. I think Let's it's, prove them wrong. Yeah, I think there is a market for this oh, kind yeah. of thing. And especially at the price where I'm able to take the, the big slice out of the price. Um, some oh. of my books, if you scroll down on the Amazon site that you have there, some of my books sell for more than $100. And this one's comprehensive of those books 
and is sell for under 20 for a bit. Yeah, this classic right here is that's 78, 78, 70, yeah, 60 70. bucks. Yeah. So you, Boy, if you keep scrolling down, you'll get to uh, 85, dollars, hundred dollars for this one. These yep. are all academic stuff, but yeah, that's so this you're getting all of that, all these books that you can find for a hundred dollars, sixty five dollars, ninety dollars. You have all that stuff pretty much right in here. Right? One book for the price of 18 bucks. Yeah. I'm I mean, sure. obviously there are some things he has to highlight and dwell on when he's doing a special, like in the other books, he might specialize in a particular area and go exhausted, but you get the gist of the arguments on all of these. And sometimes they're very exhaustive, even in this book itself. But what I think that's really, really interesting about this book so far, and I'm just highlighting my favorite parts is you're literally giving the narrative format and you don't have to be an academic to get what's going on here and to see, I mean, it's, I didn't know how good this book was. I bought it last week. I very barely glanced through it. And then we're doing the course, right? Cause we're doing an actual college course yeah. on the Greek uh, epics and their influence in the gospels mimetic course. Right. And if you're a person who's like, Whoa, this is so, even, this is a little hard for me to get through. Do you get to have an audio book? Here's your chance with the course to actually listen to us read it, and then we expound on it. We dive deep into the historical context, how this would have been relevant to this literature at the time. I mean, it gets really complicated, but it also is very good deep dive. And I'm going to just say this up front, and of course, I, I know there's going to be questions that are going to come, and people are going to want your thoughts, but this is me speaking. You guys know I've been influenced by Dennis's work, or at least I've been like, you know, there's certain examples where I'm like, I think he's on to something. I really do think there's something going on. And if I were to t like where I'm at now, where my confidence was when I first said that, I'd say I was at like a 65, 70 percent. Like I'm pretty convinced, but I'm like not I'm not like a guy who's going to go knock on your door to tell you, listen to the truth of the meta connection to the gospel. Since doing this course with him, I feel like I could knock on some doors right now. OK. Like I feel extremely confident in some of the cases he brought up. There is no doubt in my mind at this point that the author of Mark is using without a doubt, the Homeric epic stories and many of those stories pop up. There's just no doubt in my mind now. And I'm convinced this is, I don't know the Greek, right? I don't know the Greek, but I know narratives. I know themes. I'm, I'm someone who can see and connect the dots. Right. And I'm blown away. <laughs> You're very kind. Right. Well, the links, I mean, this is a fact. I'm not just. Yeah, no, I understand. No, it's very, very much a fact. And like the, I, this, the links in the description. It's also pinned in the comments. You can't miss it. And we will bring this topic back up and talk about more before we, when we get more people to watching, we'll jump back on this. But there is a few questions. If you guys don't mind, want to jump to those or anything else you want to say? Yeah, real quick at the top. Go to the very, very top, Neil. Oh, of, of comments. Uh, hold on, I gotta scroll. Yeah, away. no, Ollie Rowan is a member, and she yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just tell Ollie we're not gonna answer this. I'm gonna tell you why. I already recorded it with Dennis in 4K because you emailed me and joined, and you participated, and you became you know a patron of mine. I already recorded your questions. Don't worry, they'll come out. Oh, is this was this a question? Is it, so this question's already set and done for this i've already podcast. recorded this in 4k with dennis and i haven't then, edited it and, and published and, it, but and you're it. talking about this is for ollie yes this video this is what i've been trying oh, to tell people okay so i just want to just want to let ollie know we're not ignoring it for someone else oh this no 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 video. ollie we already answered the question for you ollie so that's coming there you go okay that's that's, that's my little incentive for joining the patreon you. it's like get a video in 4k with it's your video yeah it's Tell me where you're going to find someone you can pay $3 a month. Well, I mean, that, that's, on. that handles that then, I guess. So, I mean, if you want to jump to the next one or even just yeah, say yeah, something yeah. on it. No, okay, no, no. We'll okay. Go sounds good. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you for that. Salvation, the 199. Thank you for the super chat. No evidence of Greek influence on Jesus. Ooh, just a drive-by <laughs> drive by comment, but they paid for it. So comment, Dr. McDonald, if you will. Here, bring us up on the screen if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... Well, first of all, I think the issue is what does Greek influence mean? If someone is living in Galilee, um, and even though they are steeped in Judaism, they can't escape Hellenism. 
So um, that's the first thing. The second is I'm not making claims about Jesus, the historical Jesus. I'm making claims about the Gospels and the um, the text that the Gospels seem to have used, the Lost Gospel Q, which I call the Logoi of Jesus, which probably was its title. So um, I think nobody living in um, the, uh, the the Galilee area can be uh, excused from uh, influence of Hellenism. Got that right. So um, th that I think is a given. Now, whether Jesus is influenced by the Homeric epics uh, or Greek tragedy or Greek philosophy, I'd be as skeptical as you seem to be. Here's the problem, Dennis, and your <laughs> Neil, you're gonna you're gonna get what I'm trying to say when I come with this. Salvation has shown up. Let me give you a little context. Yeah. They've shown up in other channels. They said something like, "You're gonna go to hell and get thrown." Yeah, away. this person loves to come by. Was, yeah, and, and and look, we I appreciate the two dollars. You're helping my yeah, friend. I don't. I I'll take anything. If you want to say you're a big boogeyman, I don't like you. Pay me. Cool. Yeah. Check this out. Um, salvation doesn't think that way. See, when you're when you're addressing people like me and Neil, when you go, well, the historical Jesus. I'm sorry. What the gospels say is what Jesus said, according to these people. Okay. So like you're actually attacking the worldview in a sense by saying the gospels themselves are Greekly, they're influenced by the Greek epics and whatnot. And so this is actually a saying of no, they're not. And so that's okay. what I'm trying to say. And you're trying to say you don't, you're obviously not aware and therefore either ignorant purposefully or just don't know. And I say if the if the question were no evidence of Greek, Greek influence on the Jesus of the Gospels, salvation, I would say that is intentionally ignorant. I'm sorry to say it. And I'm not sorry to say it anymore, but he is. <laughs> no, yeah. This is, look, this channel much and I I'm this channel is all about trying to be as objective as possible about <clears throat> these things. And not trying to sugarcoat anything, bring it, bring it to us. Like, and 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 oh, and salvation. That doesn't mean you're not welcome to come and challenge us, like you've been doing. I, I love it. that too. Keep that energy there, and but you, you're going to get straight answers from from scholars like Dick, uh, Dr. McDonald, like you just got. So be aware of that. What well, it's true. So you, I you, mean, you're just not, you're just not in church right now. You're not going to get. You're not going to hear what you want to hear. So, just uh, in case you're wondering, there's like almost 600 pages, and these aren't normal pages, by the way. These are pretty big. Sorry, I'm getting close to your face, but yeah, these are pretty big pages. Too. And that's a um, anyone who says there's no evidence has not read. Yeah, point yeah. blank. Yeah. Well, so. there's that one. Thank you for the super chat, Gaius Julius Windex. Always good to see you in the chat. Can you explain to us how the tragic and poetic stories of Athens and Ionia influence the Gospels? Um, we kind of had a question like that earlier. Where it was like, the, uh, I'm not uh, as familiar with the Ionian tradition. I the what? the poetry I, of Homer, Athens. Isn't Homer Ionian? I'm sorry. Isn't Homer an Ionian or no? Um, there's a debate about the origin of the Homeric okay. epics and his home. Um, how can you explain the stories in their influence of the Gospels? Uh, the authors of the Gospels are living in the Greco-Roman world, and they so valor uh, 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 are taken by Jesus that they want their uh, depictions of Jesus to be competitive with the heroes and deities of the Greco-Roman world. And to do so, they write counter mythologies. These are called syncrasies, uh, that is comparisons of, let's say, uh, uh, Hector or uh, Odysseus or uh, Heracles and Jesus to show that Jesus is more compassionate or he has more divine qualities, or he is stronger. So that it's a part of early Christian identity formation. So these stories are foundational mythologies written over against the mythologies of the Greeks that are around them. And um, Homer is everywhere in um, ancient literature and in uh, education. And uh, it's um, inevitable, I think, 
the Jews and Christians, by the way, Jews do the same thing. Uh, they invitate him, Homer also, uh, sometimes even to oppose Hellenism. <laughs> And so uh, it, there's an irony there, to be sure. <laughs> um, but um, th that's why they're doing it. It's to create foundation mythologies for their communities to uh, uh, claim that Jesus is a divine agent and to give support to their communities that are struggling for identities in the Greco-Roman world. Wow. Incredible. Thank you for that question. Incredible answer. I appreciate that as well. And Ricky Johnson, just want to give you a shout out for that super sticker. I really appreciate that. You know, you, you can always jump, throw a tag a question on at the end if you want. But uh, I appreciate that as well. Thank you for that. I'm looking for more questions. I think we have a couple more. Let's see what we got. It's super chat your questions for Dennis, everybody. Yeah. Um, we only have him for a short period of time, but the poor you always have with you. <laughs> Imposter yeah. Sir Spence. Thank you for that. Is Jewish is Jesus a Jewish Socrates? Why or why not? Oh, in many ways he is, um, and the analogies can be uh, artificial, but they are extensive potentially. Uh, neither Jesus nor Socrates wrote anything. They were both heroes of the moral world, and they died because of greed and misunderstanding. Their followers, with cognitive dissonance, I suppose, uh, cherished his memory and wrote, uh, Aristophanes wrote plays about Socrates, uh, the frogs, in order to uh, mock him. We have dialogues of Plato that record, um, or at least imagine, um, his conversations with many people. Xenophon writes a defense in the memorabilia of um, and in the apology of um, the, the trial and the teachings of uh, Socrates, uh, just as the gospel authors write um, the stories about Jesus's teachings, the tragedy of his death, and so on. Um, both of them then had initiated um, traditions and institutions so that the Plato's Academy owes a great deal to uh, Socrates. So in a different way do Sto our Stoics. But of course, the Jesus movement stimulated a number of different uh, spin-off religious groups, um, and they produced their own literature, including apocryphal literature. So the similarities between Jesus and Socrates are quite amazing. They're also amazing if we can trust the, uh, the content about what people said about so what Socrates said and what Jesus said, they challenged the religion of the city or of, the, of, of Judaism, and it was their challenge to uh, those expectations that caused them to be killed by people who didn't like social upheaval. So just as Socrates was killed for uh, polluting the youths of Athens and for introducing new deities, so Jesus could be accused of introducing a new um, understanding of Jewish law and corrupting people who were attracted to his, his, um, his message. So I think those analogies are really quite strong. And if you add to that the assessment of social identity theory, what happens in a groups full of philosophical or religious groups is they identify with prototypical leaders that represent the moral values and teachings of the community that then forms the identity of these groups and allows them to identify themselves as different from various outgroups. Mm -hmm. And then that causes self-stereotyping, that is, we are like Socrates, or heterostereotyping, we are not like the damn Aristotelians or, uh, or Pythagoreans. Well, there's a Pythagorean uh, emphasis in, uh, in Plato to some extent. So um, I think that the, the analogies between Jesus and Socrates um, merit underscoring, and I appreciate your question very much. Wow, that was incredible. Really, thank you, Impossible for Spence. I skipped Dan Ellerby and I just went back to him. Sorry, I'm glad I caught it though. Thank you for the super, bad, super chat, Dustin. <laughs> About to order it right now. Awesome. Thank you, 
to all of you for bringing us this material to dwell upon. No, it really is like I'm not Neil. I can't, man. If you're not a reader, I get it. It's hard. It's even hard for me when I do read. Like it's hard to find the time. It's hard to. But if you go in and you just chip away a section at a time or even a couple pages, you will find out real quick how dense and how how amazing the comparisons are. And, you know, I was going to mention something here. Dustin, thank you for buying the book. I was thinking of the cup that Jesus asks to pass. Right? Oh, absolutely. That is so Socrates. It's not even funny. Yeah. And also uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus f forgives the person um, who the, the people who are killing him, and Socrates forgives the uh, the attendant who's gi giving them the cup of hemlock. So you have this uh, <laughs> father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing is purely Socratic. Isn't his death in Luke also portrayed without the fear? Um, well, oh, yes, absolutely. Jesus doesn't face his death with fear. Uh, just as Socrates in the Phaedo tells his associates that they can have, they can expect to have on their death um, a better lifetime in the hereafter. And Jesus tells the righteous thief, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. So there's that optimism for the, for the followers. In Mark, Jesus dies alone. In Luke, Jesus is surrounded by his associates the same way that Socrates is. Now, I'm not the only person who has seen these parallels. Mm -hmm. But uh, once you start comparing the Fido and, let's say, Luke's depiction of the death of Jesus, you'll be quite shocked. <laughs> it, yeah. it really is quite special. Now, I want to say one thing, Neil, to the people who are ordering the book. Mm -hmm. I'm so gratified that you're doing so, but I also will be gratified if after you spend time with the book and you have any corrections, let me know, but even more so if you could write just a positive three Pay, you know, three paragraphs or something. No, no, three sentence review of it for okay. Amazon. That three will help. Paragraphs. I, I got Not three to say. paragraphs. No, no, just I'm going to do a video review actually because they have those now on Amazon and so yeah. someone can watch and hear me explain. But there you I go. got too much to say, so there's no way I can go great book, love star. it, recommend it, five star piece. Uh, there's too much to say for me, but I feel you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Thanks. Sorry, I'm bragging on you. No, no, no. Gotta, thank, you. thank you for that super chat. Muslim <laughs> apologists, by the way, Muslim apologist has his own channel, and I I'm a fan of people who jump into the marketplace of ideas and, you know, hold yeah. their ground. And a Muslim apologist, he does a lot of videos, very critical of Christianity and and sometimes Judaism and you know, how Yahweh might be a pagan God, but Allah is the real true one God. I love that kind of content, even though I might not be aligned with Muslim apologists, but I, I still like to see his arguments in the in this marketplace, in this arena. It's really fun. And I'm glad you're here watching me right now. That really makes me. um it makes me happy but uh thank you for the super chat did philo of alexandria influence the gospel of john i'm going to parse that question a little uh bit no i don't think philo influenced the gospel of john if we're talking about the philonic corpus but i do think that there are things in the gospel of john that will remind one of a jewish form of middle platonism now, um, but I don't think they're as extensive as John's indebtedness to uh, Dionysian religion and um, the, uh, the, the uh, Euripidean uh, play, the, the Bacchae. But what you're identifying is that the Gospel of John and Philo of Alexandria are both drinking from the, uh, the, the Septuagint to some extent, and are philosophically sophisticated. So one can see this, for example, in the Gospel of John in the famous prologue, where the Logos has come into the world and is doing so to give gift after gift, and he gives life and so on. Uh, Philo is very concerned with the Logos and um, in, in treating it in a Jewish context. So your question is learned. And it's clever. 
And I do think one can make a case that there are uh, echoes of the kinds of uh, Jewish Middle Platonism that we find in Philo in the Gospel of John, but I wouldn't want to talk about it as influence. Incredible stuff. I love it. I love the question. Uh, yeah, so, very good question. And don't forget, right off the bat, in the beginning is the logos. A lot of your English translations will say the word with a capital W. When we go back to that Greek, it's the logos, and that's the logos that you see in Philo. So there's also that too. Don't forget about that. And I love the question. Thank you for that. Hey, actually, Neil, if I might, yeah. The the in my view, um, the title of the Lost Gospel Q was the logoi or sayings of Jesus. Wow. The beginning of the Septuagint of Deuteronomy is these are the logoi that Moses spoke in the wilderness. The Hebrew title of the book of Deuteronomy is Hadabarim, the words, and they're the words of Moses. When you get to um, the Gospel of Luke, Luke's prologue says, uh, Theophilus, I'm going to write these things so you may be sure about the logoi that you have been taught. The Gospel of Thomas says these are the secret logoi that the risen Jesus, the living Jesus, gave to uh, Thomas, uh, Didymus. So the idea of logos or logoi is deeply embedded in the gospel tradition. Uh, and I think logoi comes in the, uh, the Q document as an imitation of Deuteronomy. So this notion of the Logos in the Gospel of John is personifying the word. So it's no longer the word that Jesus speaks, but he himself is the Logos that comes into the world and speaks to it uh, as a divine agent. And that's a bit different from the way Philo treats the, uh, the Logos, but it's not all that different because the Logos in Philo plays a function very much like Sophia in Jewish wisdom. And of course, Neil knows the importance of Logos and Sophia in Gnosticism. Yeah. So um, you've got this uh, really clever matrix and history of a use of a word that now in John becomes personified, and there are places in Philo where the Logos plays a personified function, and certainly in Gnosticism. Yeah. Wow, that was incredible. Right before we switch to the next one, you just, wait, hold on, hold on, wait, we got one more. That was amazing. Good stuff right there. Muslim apologists, I hope you clip that and make that into a, into a video for like a short or something, because that was some good stuff right there. Thank you for that. Um, Seth, hi. Thank you for the super chat. Three assets for humanity. Please take my money. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that a, I wonder if that's a question. Three assets for humanity. Sounds just like a statement. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Oh, does it mean us three? Wait, is that what I mean? imagine? You oh, know, I imagine Father, Son, oh, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Exactly. <laughs> I just My name is Telemachus, by the way, in case anyone's wondering. But oh, by the way, Dennis, Dennis McDonald, the word Dennis is actually from Dionysus, right? Can you tell yes, me? Yes, it is. Yeah. So your name is actually would be like Dionysus of Macedonia. Is that, is that true or no? Oh, that's what somebody has tried. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I love it. I love etymology. It's so fun to play around. I, I, I'm actually having somebody come on. Actually, I'm not, can't say when yet, but very soon to do some, some, uh, Philo philology i think it's called or is yes it, it is sure. yeah philology yeah so that'll be fun but uh thank you for that super chat jamie lindbrunner tell us about odysseus and anointing feet versus jesus oh, oh, oh. Um, odysseus has to keep his identity a secret when he comes home lest the suitors slay him and he's able to keep his identity secret except to tell Telemachus that he's returned home. And he can't keep his identity a secret from his dog who sniffs him and can tell that it's the master. And then he dies immediately. But um, Penelope wants to show Odysseus the beggar hospitality. 
as a visiting poor man. And she invites Eurycleia, whose name means renowned far and wide, to wash the feet of Odysseus. And, Odysse and Eurycleia was his old nurse. In his youth, he was gored by a boar and had a thigh wound um, that um, left a big, a big scar. And while Eurycleia was washing his feet, she recognized the scar. And on the, because of that token, she knew that her master had returned. And thus she had to, uh, he had to say, don't tell anybody that I'm back, because if you do, they're, um, they're going to try to kill me. So Eurycleia was able to manipulate the female slaves to put them in line for the slaying of the suitors. Odysseus reveals himself to uh, two of his uh, male slaves, and they, as well as Telemachus the son, are going to slay the suitors. So what happens in the Gospel of uh, Mark? A woman comes to Jesus and she recognizes something about Jesus that others do not. And she anoints his head um, in recognition. And um, Jesus then says what she has done will be announced wherever the gospel is preached. In other words, she will have, she will have renown widespread renown. That's the name of your, that's what Eurycleia means. Wow. When Byzantine poets retold the gospel story, they used lines from the Odyssey, the niptra of uh, Eurycleia's washing, and they exploit the, uh, the, the image of uh, having Eurycleia, that is a widespread renown. So wow. in this case, Mark is advertising his Homeric imitation. He wants people to see that um, the, the woman who's anointing Jesus is playing the role of noble Eurycleia. Wow. I, 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 there's so I, many levels. I, I, every time I hear that, I just forget how profound that is. That sort of retelling of a story that's held sacred to the Greeks you know, it's not copying or plagiarizing. It's a retelling. It's a, they're applying yeah. it. Jesus. Jamie, that was a great question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. There's a couple more. Thank you for that, Jamie. Let's get to the next one is Max the Confessor. Thank you for the super chat. Not totally in your wheelhouse, but does the wisdom of Solomon have a lot of Greek parallels? Oh, yes, it certainly does. Um, but it's not the kind of parallels that we would have from Greek poetry. It's a more from um, philosophy. And it's not citation so much as um, uh, Hellenistic, uh, Middle Platonic, probably Middle Platonic and somewhat Stoic um, uh, wisdom. But uh, yes, you're, you're on to something that uh, I'm not an authority on the wisdom of Solomon by any means, but it often is used as an example of um, clever Hellenism inside Judaism, um, attributed in this case to the wisdom of Solomon. Excellent stuff. Thank you for that super chat. Moseon, like him, thank you for the super chat. Thank you all. Do you feel the lack of classical education in the modern age has led to a demise in civics and democratic vitality? Christian nationalism on the rise and anti-intellectualism? Ooh, that's a deep one. Damn, we talked a little bit about this already. Well, I think there's no doubt about it. Um, in our universities now, STEM has overtaken, uh, and capitalism has overtaken humanities. And we have uh, fewer and fewer positions in English and history and philosophy, and especially in classics. Now, when that happens, um, the the classical background of the New Testament seems further remote. And people then read the New Testament as if they're reading science because science is what they've been exposed to in school. And I don't know that it, uh, uh, in, it I don't know that it feeds Christian nationalism, but I think it feeds general uh, amnesia of 
um, culture. And it does attend, um, it is anti-intellectual in a way. And um, of course, I'm a fan of science. I am a fan of mathematics and uh, those fields. But I don't think it's fair to uh, cut off um, classical education and rhetoric and history and philosophy, because we as a culture are going to suffer for that loss. Excellent point. And I love the question. I think you're right. You're right on. The, the more we, I, that's why I love Derek. That's why I love watching your channel before I started my channel, because I was learning so much about the, the ancient world that I didn't even understand, didn't even know was there. Mm -hmm. And people like Dr. McDonald and uh, other scholars who are bringing this material to the, to the mainstream is really huge, really big plus. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean that 100%. So thank you for, thank you. Let me, let me say something to you and Derek yeah. and to your viewers. I am so humbled by the attention this work is getting, but I'm not a genius. I'm a hard worker. I've been exposed to wonderful education. And I've spent my life in pursuit of what I think is a successful break from fundamentalism that I grew up with. And I feel that my role in this case is a beggar who found a full loaf of bread and I need to share it. Nice. And I'm happy that there are so many people out there that can share the bread without having to share a lot of the bread from their pocket. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That's a real well said. And I really appreciate that super chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ricky Johnson. Oh, another name. Always a uh, yeah, familiar face. Thank you for the super chat. I got the book looking forward to reading it. There we go. Yeah. It's another and it's not like a, it's not like a read, like you would read regular books. There are, there are sections where it reads like that, but it's like, it is something you're going to want to get a group together. This would be awesome. Get a group of other skeptics, Gnostics, spiritualists, Christians, doesn't matter where you come from. Get together, read it, discuss it. Right. It's one of those, and you're just going to want to tell someone about it. If they're into this stuff and they're weird like we are, you're going to want to tell somebody about it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's comparative mythology at its yep. finest. It really is. It is. So yep. if yep. you like this channel, you'll like this book. Good. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Ricky. Constellation Pegasus in the house. I can't figure this out. Was the Zohar and Kabbalah written and being practiced before the Babylonian exile? If not, then Jews today must be practicing a form of Babylonian magic. Was it all oral tradition before the defeat? Oh my gosh, that's so out of my uh, wheelhouse. I don't know how to respond. My understanding is that there were forms of um, Jewish esotericism that uh, go way back, but they were not a characteristic of typical uh, Judaism. And um, I don't, I, I really don't know what to say about it. Um, I think the evidence is, is either non-existent or quite thin. Um, but you, you do find uh, elements of, um, of uh, at least of Jewish mysticism at an early point. And uh, it's quite possible that there's a line to be drawn from that. Um, one of the challenges of a question like this is not just about Judaism, but um, there's been a, a interest in history of religion for a long time. And the question is, is the history of religion linear or is it sporadic? Do you have um, new insights coming out in religion um, at, at about the same time? There's a there's a, a synchrosis, uh, I mean a, a, a synchrony between um, the the time that these insights come out, and often when we see similarities, we don't see the missing links that hold, let's say, um, Kabbalah to earlier forms of Jewish mysticism. And much of that filling in of the gaps becomes conjectural. And one one needs is good criteria for making the bridge from certain kinds of mysticism to the Kabbalah and the Zohar. So um, I'm not in a position to do that. Uh, I respect very much the scholars who study this 
but I think they would uh, concur that often the gaps um, in the history of religion are difficult to establish. This is one reason I like mimesis, because mimesis actually allows one to see what the bridge is between one text and another. So you can see that Homer is being um, imitated uh, in the Gospels, or that uh, Plato is being imitated in the Acts of the Apostles. You don't have to worry about missing links. You have direct contact between these texts. And I wish one could have that in other disciplines where you can see uh, a literary mimetic connection from one text to another. So we don't have to be guessing about missing links. And if I can just tag on to that uh, question to kind of answer, from what I understand, the Zohar and Kabbalah are late documents. That's right. That doesn't mean there weren't mystics, but there's always been mystics. So, you know, just like if you go to Freemasonry, they're going to say, we go back to King Solomon. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Now they say their tradition goes back. I mean, everyone wants a pedigree. Everyone needs a foundation mythology and they stretch themselves way back. But historically and evidence wise, there is no evidence of that continued tradition. Simple fact is there's always been a mystic. So there are mystics. Um, and by the way, the term, the Babylonian exile, there's the Babylonian Talmud, but really that's actually just a Talmud that is, of course, in the CE, the common era that is developed in the region of where Babylon was located. And of course you have the Jerusalem Talmud as well. Two different Talmuds, you know, being developed in different locations and one is being taken place where uh, you could say Babylon was, but the idea that this goes way back, there might be some tradition. There's no evidence of it actually going back. That's, That's what right. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for that. Thanks Derek and Dennis for that. I got the book. Oh, did I just skip this one? Okay. Yeah, I just, but I'd like to see it again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's Chris Addy. There you go. Thank you, Chris Addy for the super chat. I just got my copy. Just skimming it. I feel smarter. Woohoo. There's the that's the that's the effect that Dennis McDonald puts on you. Oh, we forgot to mention that if you don't want to be smarter, you can use the book as a weapon. Nice. So it's heavy, it can defend you, you can wear it, get some duct tape, wrap it around your chest under your shirt in case you get shot. It's bulletproof. There's a lot of uh, uses for this book in case you ever don't yeah. want to read it. Thank you, Chris Addy, for that. That's great to hear. Great to hear. Rat King, my good, good friend. We're always texting back and forth we he's into the same stuff i'm into thank you for the super chat i've just attained true gnosis thanks for all your hard work Gnostic for me. Well, thank <laughs> you for watching and we'll be shooting back and forth later tonight i'm sure and uh it's always good to see you around and thank you really appreciate that Ilias almadi thank you for the ten dollars i'm actually interested in how x mimics the gospels or vice versa can Dr. McDonald speak to us about the parallels between what Jesus does in the Gospels and what Peter and Paul do in Acts? Interesting. Well, and, and that's been well studied. Yeah. Um, because what the Acts of the Apostles does is to create a chain of authority that goes from John the Baptist to Jesus to Peter and the Eleven at the beginning of Acts. Then from there, we find Stephen to play an interesting transitional role. And then we find Paul, who was the persecutor, and then he becomes the primary um, uh, a, a point of attention in the Acts of the Apostles. And then in chapter 20, he lays hands on the elders of uh, the, the church in Ephesus and says that they are now to ones to be the guardians of the flock. And we have in the pastoral epistles this issue of laying on of hands as well, which is a way of transmitting authority to uh, the future. In the Gospel of um, uh, Matthew, it's Peter who is the one who um, establishes that authority. In the fourth gospel, it is the beloved disciple who does so. In the Thomas tradition, it's Judas Didymus Thomas, who's the one who receives the revelations and wow. uh, takes it forward. But in order to establish the similarities between 
of the characters in these um, uh, in this chain of authority, things that Jesus does gets repeated for Peter and Paul and potentially with the elders. So, for example, Jesus, Peter, and Paul can exorcise. Jesus, Peter, and Paul all convert a Roman authority at the beginning of their ministries. So in the case of Jesus, it's the centurion's son. Mm -hmm. In the case of Peter, it's Cornelius. In the case of Paul, it is um, Sergius Paulus, uh, which is when he changes his name. And they all heal dead too. They all, all they they raise the dead. They all they all can interpret scriptures. So that in uh, Luke, uh, Jesus opens um, the book book of Isaiah and uh, reads the, uh, the 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 promise of a victor coming in the future. Uh, Peter interprets uh, the Bible, and so does Paul in chapter 13 of the Acts of the Apostles, and they draw their own uh, histories of Israel. In or, and by the way, Stephen does too. Stephen um, gives a, a, a history of Israel um, and uh, gives his life for it. So this has been explored at the literary level by many scholars. And it's really quite rewarding and wonderful that this chain of authority um, includes uh, imitation of Jesus by Peter and Paul and then uh, beyond. So when Peter, uh, when Paul uh, lays hands on the Ephesian elders, he tells them to do what he does. And he's been doing what Jesus and Peter has done. So um, you, this question is really very rich, yeah. and um, I could point you to some some literature that will really uh, thrill you. I think because your question, it'll just verify that your question is right on target. Mm -hmm. And to put it simply, for those of us who are shocked to find out, all of the gospels disagree on who the authority is and the, and the accounts in which how they happen. So if you're curious to go, oh, snap, for those harmonizers out there, um, even Christian academic Dale C. Allison Jr., who's a legit bona fide scholar, will tell you harmonizers, like harmonizing and harmonizing scholarship died, I think he said in like 18, I can't remember what it was, 19th century. Like this is, oh. this is, stop. So yeah. Christian apologists are carrying on a dead tradition. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. And real quick, just before we go to the next one, I just want to, you, you mentioned how they're trying to show the chain of authority going from John the Baptist to Jesus to the apostles to, you know, James, Paul, and Peter. But even before that, before we even get to Jesus, you got them tying John the Baptist to Elijah. And Elijah is another character who's healing the dead and performing miracles and, um, he's also an outside of the temple character that you don't, he's not in the temple. He's not a high priest. He's a, he's a, he's an outside figure. Sort of like, they're sort of like coming up, they try to claim that as their own is like, we're the, we're the new version of that basically. Sure. So I think that's interesting too, but, uh, thank you for that super chat. The next one is scrolling through these comments here. So quite a bit, Nick Smallwood, Nick Smallwood. Good to see you. Was Jesus the fourth Dionysus? Ooh, Zagreus, Dionysus, Yacus. Jesus. <laughs> I never thought about it like that. It's interesting. Um, well, the, the there are in in Greek mythology, there are basically two Dionysuses, but there are about eight different titles and names that are given to him. Mm. So Iacus is one of them. It's related to Bacchus. Uh, Bacchus is really di a Roman Dionysus. Um, but you have the Zagreus uh, tradition. Potter Lieber. So in, in the artwork of Dionysus, you can see that sometimes Dionysus is an old man with a beard. And in other times, he has um, he's clean shaven and he's young. But it's the same character. And this is the origin of Dionysian polymorphism. That is, the god can take the, the, the appearance of anyone he wishes. 
And that's why you have there's so that's uh, the the bearded Dionysus. Um, and then uh, Neil may be able to pull up the the other Dionysus. Yep. So visually and in the mythology, there are two very different Dionysuses and their mythologies merge, but ultimately they're different. So, Nick, your question is really very learned and clever. So I don't know if he's a fourth Dionysus, but one could say he's a third and his the the Dionysus that he's most likely uh, uh, most like is a the young Dionysus. And you can see this in the um, pig, the um, uh, iconography that uh, Jesus seldom is bearded. After all, he died as a young man. So it was the uh, the young Dionysus that became much more popular. Um, but the, you're you're right on target that you have uh, multiple names for Dionysus. Um, and there, it, there was ancient confusion, but the biggest confusion was between Zagreus um, Dionysus and the Dionysus the, who's young. So there's Dionysus who's young. He sh uh, I think that's changed. Jesus. Oh, that's Jesus? Yeah, Jesus no, put Jesus. water into wine with no beer. Oh, yeah, with a magic wand. Yeah, you can't yeah. tell me that doesn't look like Dionysus, though, because yep. you can tell there's the the um, the wine. The wine skins. And the hemation that he's wearing, too. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and and on top of that, you also have Dionysus being identified with, with Osiris. You have Herodotus and, and, um, and Plutarch are like, yeah, they're the same exact god, basically. <laughs> So yep. you know, it's not just Jesus. It's also Osiris who's getting identified in that mix too. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And um, oh, and the last one I wanted to mention real quick, the the god Sabatios. It's oh, a, that's right. They they they're like, yeah, that's Dionysus basically too. So like a lot of gods get connected with Dionysus in so many ways. So well, the other uh, the related issue is that in the Johannine tradition, Jesus can take several forms. So in the uh, uh, Acts of John, um, Jesus appears to James and John and calls them to be disciples. But James and John, one of them sees an old man and the other one sees a young man. So they see both manifestations of Dionysus. And that's in a Christian text where Jesus appears with uh, this polymorphism. And it shows how divine he is because there's no single... Uh, human manifestation that can fully um, uh, uh, capture who he is to human beings. Wow. <clears throat> Incredible stuff. Great question. Very, very creative thought. I, I never thought it that way. That's a really interesting way to think about it. Thank you for that. Constellation Pegasus. Love seeing you in the chat as always. Thank you for that. What do you think of 1 Corinthians 740? We are, well, Paul is saying this to me. Um, can you remind me what I'm first? Read okay, sure, Derek, you, you got it. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Um, <clears throat> but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the spirit of God. Well, I the think... wife is bound by the law, so as long as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, mm -hmm. she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the spirit of God. Uh, I think I would interpret that in light of um, the apostles view that Jesus is going to return soon and that marital status status um, should be considered stable for the time being because the end is coming soon. Yeah. And later on, actually, in that chapter, Paul says that the end is coming soon. I mean, two, so three you, verses earlier, he says, nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast. In his, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 38. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. <laughs> like, yeah. And, but it's because the end is coming soon. Exactly. Yeah. I'm reading the King James. So I would say <laughs> um, one should not apply this as a universal attitude of, um, to marriage and not even for Paul. If you if we told Paul that the uh, the world is going to last for another two thousand years, I think he'd reconsider. Oh yeah, wow. that's great. That was a great. I question. tend, and I know you can't pin this down, but I tend to think the same of Jesus. 
And I know that you can't pin that down, which means you're in speculation land. But when the thrust of everything is heading in one direction, I think it would be hard. You'd be hard pressed to show Jesus wasn't like John the Baptist, like Jesus, like all the other apocalyptic figures for me. Right. Yeah. This is me. And uh, and I think there's plenty of other people who would agree. But anyway, that's my thoughts. Well, I think apocalypticism, Jewish apocalypticism is the cradle of uh, early that's Christianity. Yeah. And you have it in Paul. You yeah. have it in um, Sibylline Judaism. In that's what I call it. I call it the Sibylline Judaism. Okay. <laughs> you get the Jewish, <laughs> Jewish Sibylline oracles that are. Oh, yeah, that's right. Very yeah. apocalyptic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you, Constellation Pegasus. I, I clicked off your thing, but I didn't mean to. It was I was still talking. But thank you for that super chat. Appreciate it. Uh, Ali Rowan, a member of the channel, has a great question here. Could John's gospel in pages like Matt Matthew seven thirteen to twenty three be refuting a Dionysian like mystery cult that was infiltrating the church households with their other gospel and different Christ? I'll read it to you. Yeah. Inter uh, let me change this translation. I cannot. Uh, well, just add, give me what the story is. Let me, do, let me do a new living because it's super uh, heretical. It's um, all right. So here we go. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. I think I'm in the right passage. Yes. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can produce bad fruit, can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruits, so you can identify people by their actions. Uh, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter the kingdom. Uh, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, who, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Um, yes, Ellie, I think that's a, an interesting question, but no, I don't think uh, it's refuting a Dionysian-like mystery cult. Um, the Almost every word in what we find in Matthew 7 in that passage comes from the Q document. And it's Matthew's read of the Q document, and it goes something like this. In the Q document, Jesus sends out missionaries to beg to take nothing in their bag, and so on, and to uh, live off of the generosity of the people where they go. But we know in the Didache, which is a part of the Mathean tradition in my view, that that was abused, and Paul didn't want to have part of that abuse, so he works for himself and does not rely on, uh, on begging that way. So, but Matthew's treatment is somewhat different. He, like the author of the Didache, is saying, okay, there are people out there whom Jesus sent out as uh, sheep amid, amid wolves, but some of the would-be sheep actually are wolves themselves. And if you want to know who to receive and who not to receive, you test to see what the fruits are that they have so that you test them, uh, uh, their fruit, and then you can tell if they, in fact, are representatives, representatives of Jesus or not. So I don't think it's a Dionysian-like mystery cult. I actually think it's more like a Q community um, mission um, uh, problem that the missionaries go out and have to beg, and not everybody who's begging is worthy. So you have to test them, test the spirits to see um, whether they are um, legitimate or not. Real quick, just to jump in here, Neil, um, you can change the video to subscriber mode only, where subscribers can comment, just so you don't have to deal with the headache. Another thing you can do also is delay the chat by like three seconds, and it keeps these bots from being produced and being well, able. To I think comment. the mods, the mods are on it actually. Because I'm I mean, just saying, it, no, it'll I, never I, end. If, it, if I if I see that happen a couple more, one, one or two more times, I'm just going to do that. But okay. for now, I'll just leave it. Is the mods seem to be pretty good at that? 
thank you for thank you mods for getting rid of all the trolls and stuff i don't understand what they get out of like what 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 do you profit from going into comment sections and writing profane profane what do you do are you getting paid for that like what's what what causes somebody to do something so weird like that i just don't get it like, what do you benefit from that i don't i just don't understand it but thank you mods for doing your doing your thing and helping me out i really appreciate that but back to our discussion ollie thank you for that great question really good question i really enjoyed it so thank you for that constellation pegasus is back with another one and says i messed up how can paul know you don't have to send another super chat. You could just say that. I, could, I am sort of paying attention, but I guess I could. I guess whatever. Thank you. Just, whatever. Paul, how can Paul not know if he has God's spirit? So this is, but in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I am giving you counsel from God's spirit when I say this. So it sounds almost like he's not too confident in what he's saying here. And I think I'm giving you counsel from when I say this, so from God's spirit. Yeah, I mean, you have that kind of expression elsewhere in the Acts of the Apostles, where it seemed good to the church and to the Holy Spirit. So um, in some cases, they're more confident. In some cases, they're not. Um, I suppose Paul is trying to be honest there and to say that maybe he doesn't have God's spirit. I don't know. But um, <laughs> the appeal to uh, one's own judgment and to say we have God's authority for it is a pretty mighty um, claim. And um, I wouldn't take it too seriously. Thank you for that super chat. And uh, the next one's from Penny Dreadful. It's a cool name, by the way. Thank you for the super chat. How have you stayed so motivated in your study? Wow. Because I'm so angry about ignorance about the Gospels. And the abuse of Jesus's memory to support warfare, to support racism, to support income disparity, um, to uh, to support institutions and causes that uh, ha are so removed from the ethic of early Christians and the historical Jesus that a lot of my work is motivated by anger. But I also want to give you wisdom from a Jewish teacher that I had in Israel. He was the um, information officer for Hungarian Jews during the Second World War. And Eliyahu had 20 cousins before the war, and only he and one of the cousins survived after the war. And he became an atheist because he said, I cannot imagine a God would allow just people to be executed like that by such tyranny. So then I asked him at the time, I was a fundamentalist Bible thumper. <coughs> and I asked him, uh, Eliyahu, then why do you study the Hebrew scriptures so much? Uh, he was my tutor in reading the Hebrew of the book of Job when I was in a kibbutz. And uh, he said, there are three reasons that I read um, Jewish scriptures and that I'm happy to read them with you, Dennis. One is it's the literature of my people. So it's a part of my historical and social identity. It also contains human wisdom. And if I read carefully and critically, I can glean the wisdom of it. But also, I'm damn good at it. And I can tell you that that has motivated my career largely. I grew up in a Christian home, so the Bible is a part of my own historical identity. <laughs> in these texts, I find gems of wisdom and uh, understanding. And I read them critically, but that doesn't mean that I can't understand sympathetically some things in the text and and live by them and own them. And much of that is the teachings of Jesus, such as the Sermon on the Mount, let's say. Wow. And the third is I'm damn good at it. And wow. I'm hoping that my book can demonstrate that I'm not only good at that, but I'm good at trying to contextualize it in the context of Greek poetry. 
which also is a part of my cultural context. It's also a part of human wisdom. And I'd like to think that I also do that well. So I think those are legitimate reasons for studying this, these texts. And it's not to try to understand the mind of God. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you for that super chat and great answer. Cons oh, I keep skip I keep going back to the one before for some reason. Inquisitive mind, thank you for the super chat. I'm the ghost of myth vision. <laughs> See, I love you mess me now, and now we know <laughs> this kind of trolling I like because it's fun. It's not like yeah. you know something stupid, but this is funny. Thank you for that. Absolutely. The next one is Mousy on like him again. Thank you. Prefer Aristotle as a tutor or Seneca? Good question. Um, well, Seneca for wisdom, but Aristotle for science. A lot, yeah. And um, I, I think the, the advantage of Aristotle is that he wanted to craft ethics in it because of the way he understood life to be. It was an examination of science and the and living organisms, and not abstractions. Um, and I think Aristotle, of course, his corpus is much longer than Seneca's, and Seneca had a different kind of uh, political orientation. But uh, I I think the world is so much richer for Aristotle and the science that emerged from Aristotle than um, than the Seneca. Uh, uh, more political interpretations. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I because I'm I think that'd be like Stoic Stoicism versus uh, per peripatetic. Is that what they call it? The schools? Aristotle. Um, peripatetic. Yeah, the peripatetic is the Aristotle school. Yeah, yeah. And Seneca is more Stoic. Stoic, right? So that'd be it depends on what you think about those two schools, but um, both of them would be great, I think. But you know, that was a great question, though. Interesting. Uh, thank you for that super chat. Justina Carrion, thank you for the super chat. Why is Jesus' historicity more likely than being pure myth? Um, th that is, what are the, the best criteria for making a judgment of Jesus' historicity instead of uh, the mythicist position? I'm assuming that's what uh, Justina is asking. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think the um, if one were to go through the Gospels, uh, Justina, and remove everything that comes out of myth, talking to the gods, talking to the dead, walking on water, raising people from the dead, Jesus' resurrection, uh, virgin birth, and all of it, just get rid of all of it. Do you have anything left? You have a lot left. Most of the Gospels is left over. There's nothing in the mythology uh, of Jesus that tells you about the Sermon on the Mount or prophecies or uh, uh, con controversies over Jewish law or parables or aphorisms or, or uh, uh, other kinds of narratives. And those are coming from some other impulse. They're coming from of some other social identity. And Paul assumes that Jesus was actually crucified well, I think that's pretty uh, pretty concrete and, and pretty well known. So why was he crucified? He was crucified because he was doing something antisocial. Well, what was he doing that was antisocial? Was it against Rome? No, it's probably against Jewish law. And it's a, it's a, a harsh enforcement in Galilee that mag marginalized people, including uh, the Gentiles and tax collectors and women and so on. And uh, so he was a troublemaker. And so if one analyzes what's left after mythologizing, we have a Jewish leader, not a Christian, a Jewish leader who's challenging Jewish law, is getting into trouble because of it, and he is a spokesperson for wisdom with an alternative ethical understanding that is uh, about the kingdom of God. Now, I admire Jesus for his courage in challenging law that is oppressing people. I admire that. But I don't believe, as he did, in the kingdom of God or an apocalyptic vision and so on. So this is this middle category that's like Eliyahu. 
Uh, I find wisdom in these texts. But that's not an uncritical assessment of this. And I think we each have to make our own judgments about what is beautiful about the Gospels. And it could be the mythology that you think is beautiful about the Gospels. What I find beautiful about the Gospels is social ethics, the challenge of injustice, and the uh, impulse to liberation, and Jesus' courage to challenge law when it marginalizes people. And by the way, I think that's something that American culture in, in, needs to have a big dose of and that fundamentalism is tone deaf to, tone deaf to, that I think we need to recover the moral vision of early Christians and, and not simply take as historical their mythologies. Wow, that was a very good answer. <clears throat> Thank you for that question, Super Chat. Good, good question. Uh, the next one's from Tunnels AVA Sirens. Is Jesus absolute myth or just misunderstood? Maybe the, you know. Well, I, I, that's similar to the answer that I gave before. Yeah. No, he's not absolute myth. Um, and yes, he was mis misunderstood. Jesus would be shocked to know that he talked to the dead. <laughs> Jesus would have been shocked to know that he could walk on water. Jesus would have been shocked to think that he could rise from the dead. Or that his mother so, gave birth So yes, him. or his mother gave birth to him because of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I'm sure Jesus would have been shocked by all of that. So yes, he was misunderstood. But the misunderstanding is understandable given the social conditions of the communities that valued his memory. That's, um, that's lamentable. And by the way, it's that mythologized Jesus that has uh, sustained the Christian church that's looking for eternal salvation through the resurrection and all that. I think we need to be searching for wisdom and ethics. Wow, that was great. Thank you for that. I was My bad for the delay. I'm looking through my channel uh, settings to try to fix something, but... It's okay. We can move on to the next one. Wow, there's a lot of you guys are dropping super chats on me like left and right lately. I just gotta say, I'm really grateful for all of you in this community. Me, me too. Yeah, yeah. I just I wasn't expecting. I'm, I haven't been expecting all these super chats the past couple of days. Everyone's just dropping them on me. Like, thank you so much. So I appreciate that. Plus, I was sick for a while, so I kind of my my uh whatever. I'm not gonna get into that, but yeah, I was sort of took a little hit in my pay because I I got COVID and I was out for a while, but. Looks like everybody's been uh, really helping me out. Mosulian Lycium, how can one highlight the diversity of antiquity classic studies, not just Europe, but how Africa and Asia was involved? Uh, that's a very important comment. Um, some of the diversity that we can add into the discourse obviously comes from Judaism. So that's not a part of uh, classic classical studies, but um, obviously the, the Jewish background is obvious and it's important. But what about Africa, um, including Egypt? And how do we factor in the parallels that we have between Egyptian mythology and uh, the, the Gospels, say, or the, the better would be, uh, between uh, Egypt and uh, Greek mythology, or the, the Near East um, and uh, Mesopotamia and so on, and Greek mythology. We know that there was cultural exchange, and we know that there are parallels between the Odyssey and Gilgamesh that are really quite amazing. There are parallels between the Iliad and um, the Deuteronomistic history that most people haven't seen. There are parallels between the giving of the law in Genesis and the, the Jacob cycle and, and the Odyssey. And scholars have charted these similarities, but it's very difficult to draw the cultural and transmissive lines between these mythologies. How were they um, disseminated? 
Where was it uh, a hero with a thousand faces, like Joseph Campbell would have it, or was it the Lord Raglan hero cycle? So you have uh, the heroes have, that have um, a different, uh, same kinds of experiences. Is it because the military or the merchant marine um, uh, was uh, helping dissemination of the this folklore? Um, and folklorists have been have in the past spent a lot of time trying to monitor the trajectories of stories from one culture to another. So, Musayan, I think the best way to talk about how to highlight them and to uh, assess them is to say that when we have comparative mythologies, just to ask out of which culture are we more likely to have had the origin of that story? So if we have shipwreck stories, if we have um, Jonah and the whale, for example, um, we're more likely to come out of the Mediterranean cultures, including Greece. If we have stories of floods, we're more likely to be out of Egypt or the Mesopotamian area where they have river floods on almost a yearly basis. If we have um, a, a, a god who uh, throws thunderbolts, maybe the origin again is in the, in the Middle East. And so scholars have uh, compared these mythologies and looked for origins in the uh, physical um, climates and cultures from which they may have come. But I so appreciate your question that the study of antiquity and classics cannot simply be oriented toward Greece and Rome. It has to include the East, it needs to include Africa and Egypt. Um, and uh, I don't think th the uh, uh, the kind of Afrocentrism in classical studies is the way to go. But I do think we have to be open to uh, cultural exchange uh, in antiquity and see how um, various groups may have uh, shared their mythologies and tweeted them. By the way, I want to say one thing about Joseph Campbell. Joseph yeah. Campbell's theory about um, the hero with a thousand fa faces is very good from a Jungian perspective in talking about how mythology works on the human psyche and in society. Yeah. It is not good in identifying the differences between those mythologies. Good point. And so his, what folklorists called ecotypes, that is household variations on mythologies. So many cultures have mythologies of dying and rising deities. So what? That has a psychological function that says that human death and life is not the end of things, that we can be hopeful of an afterlife. But the expressions of uh, these resurrections and uh, afterlives are extremely different, and they're rooted in societies with different uh, uh, images, and so on. So we really need to enrich classical studies and the study of the Bible with attention to um, cultural diversity. Thank you for that question. Wow, thank you for that. That was a great answer. And I just real quick, just want to let you guys know that um, the book is available. The link is in the description. And um, it's also pinned on the top of the comments. You can't miss it. I'm just telling you right now it's dropped to 1848, but it's going back up to 45 with, we don't know when it could be tomorrow. It could be a couple of days. It could be a week, something like that. But it's for a short period of time, it's dropped down. I just got myself a copy and uh, thank you for that. We have a couple more super chats left. I think there's three left, something like that. And uh, let's get to those, but uh, there you go. So with that being said, Safra, Safra Brico. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you. If you take out the Greek and Hebrew references, then what is left? Um, why would one want to take out the Greek and Hebrew influences? Um, th that's who these people are. So uh, I would say if if what's left is we're asking if it's um, divine revelation, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say I don't think that's what's going to be left. Let me infer here. I think I know what this question is getting at. What they're saying is, so the stuff that's drawn from the Old Testament, 
like Isaac carrying his wood, Jesus carrying the cross, Joseph getting sold for 30 shekels, Jesus getting sold for 30 shekels. And then you have in your, like, like your scholarship shows the mimesis stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take both of those sides out, the Greek mimesis stuff and the Hebrew Bible stuff, What's original to Jesus? Oh, to, to Jesus. Yeah. yeah. This is back again. It's another mythicist slash historicist question. And and I actually had this conversation with, with, with Dennis earlier. And this is something that really I think is, is no matter what you do, if someone is convinced and they have to be a mythicist, no matter what, I've seen this happen. Like, all right, Dennis, we rip out the Greek stuff. Got it. We know that's legend or it's, it's rewriting a Greek narrative. Good chances this may not have happened, right? Oh, snap. We found Mimesis to the Hebrew Bible. Whip that out. Where's Jesus left? Well, now, oh, we got these rabbinic writings or teachings. Oh, well, I've seen this from Robert Price and, and others. They go, well, you know, there's Hillel and there's other guys. And so maybe they're just borrowing rabbinic teachings. Like how far do you want to go to just say everything is a concoction and creation and invention in the mouth of Jesus and then create the whole narrative by borrowing from everywhere else? It's easier to just say, here's a guy, he's a Jewish guy, he's teaching things, he has a following in the Galilee, that's why you have the geographic location being used, even though the legend is that area. It's actually quite embarrassing when we went over in the course, when you find out they're taking the Mediterranean legends of, of uh, pirates and ships and like literally the whole nine and put it into this little lake and call it a sea, you start seeing what they're doing. And so... Um, anyway, I think that's the implication here. Like once you rip out these references, is there anything left? Well, I think that's the reason that the recovering the Q document is so important because that I think allows us to see a literary stratum that is unaffected by the mythologies and the obvious, uh, references to the Jewish Bible. And that's a, a layer of creativity that we need to, uh, but otherwise I'll accept uh, Derek's solution. You get what I'm trying to say though. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, all right. So we ripped out the legend. Oh, well we have these weird rabbinic teachings, some parables, and we would grant many of the parables are made up. My point is, is like, let's just say there's this, Jewish rabbi at the bottom. What do you do there? Oh, well, he was invented also by other rabbinic people around. It's like you could you could do that with anything and then just walk away and go, well, it's all concocted yeah, and created. That, that's not what I want to do. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. Oh, I think I just I just figured out how to do subscribers only. Okay, cool. You, yeah, right, you just go into your studio on that specific video. So and... I'm, not, I'm not a subscriber. I'm not making you do it. I, mean, I apologize. The only reason why I'm doing this is because we're getting a lot of trolls. So I'm just going to temporarily have this on right now. Only subscribers can comment. I apologize. I'm not making you subscribe, but you could if you want to. But, uh, you know, I just have to keep the chat cleaner. Sorry about that. So I just did that. That's now installed. Thank you for the mods who've been really. I should I should t pay you guys for all the work you've been we'll doing. Get the rewards in heaven. Yeah. So thank you for that super chat. Thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, the next one. There's two more left. Let's see. Two more left. Hold on one second. I have to go back up to the chat. I had to go down. Okay, Tunnels, AVA, Sirens. Thank you for the Super Chat. What was Jesus' true message from your study? Thank you for answering my questions. I've had here 10 minutes and agree with you and appreciate you. Um, it's going to be similar to what I said before. Um, that is that uh, Jesus was a polemicist in the Q document about the law and felt that Jewish law was too restrictive and was marginalizing other Jews. And he he believed that the Torah was given by God. And he also thought it was appropriate to obey the commandments, but it was not okay to insist that every commandment be handled by every, be followed by everyone. And it's in the Q document that we have the double love command, love the Lord your God your, and uh, your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you will live. But in Deuteronomy, it says you have to obey all the commandments and you will live. So Jesus is in, in his vision of the kingdom of God. There are some who are going to be least in the kingdom of God. They're in the kingdom of God, but they don't obey all the commandments. And that's okay. So it's redefining under the rubric of the kingdom of God what it means to be uh, a faithful. And I think this is part of the Pauline mission. That's why he's trying to adjust Jewish law to accommodate Gentiles. 
And so I think there's good reason to think that that was the uh, center of, Jew, of Jesus's message, is to make Jewish law more compatible to uh, the ne necessities and vagaries of human life. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you for that super chat. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, oh, yeah, here's a good one by Nick Smallwood. What's your take on Jesus and the boy in the park? And they mean the garden that gets sent to me. We just did a recording on this. This was the in the course. The last one we did was what the naked running boy that was running, yeah. I think, or the one seated in the two. Right. Either way, it's the same thing. Oh, um, the naked youth who flees at Jesus' arrest? Yes. I think so. Oh, <laughs> yes. it's an imitation of El Panor in the Odyssey. Really? And we actually have art that shows uh, a naked El Panor coming out of the netherworld to greet Odysseus. And um, the argument is really pretty complex, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm, I'm leery about going into the details. But um, it, he's the naked boy leaving at the arrest naked. But he's the same character that appears in Jesus's tomb now clothed. Both times he's called a Neoniskos, a young man. In both cases, it's talking about what he's wearing, that he's in one case, he's wearing a shroud, a sindone, uh, with the same word that's used for Jesus's shroud. In the other, he's wearing a robe. In one, he flees, hoping he doesn't have to die. And in the other, he's giving witness to the resurrection. So, um, Nick, compare the uh, passage in uh, Mark 14, 51 to 52, with the young man in the tomb in, um, in uh, Mark 16, 4 to 8, and I think it'll just knock you down. Wow. Wait, can you just say that one more time, the, the two things that compare, the two passages? Mark 14. Mark 14, 51 to 52, a naked young man, a, a young man yeah. wearing only a syndone flees at Jesus's arrest. No, what's the what's the one that compare that to? The the, uh, the, the end of the Gospel of Mark, Mark sixteen four to eight. The, the, the boy that's in no, the I tomb. Saying, I was saying which part of uh, the Odyssey? El Panor, El Panor. You're okay. talking about the the Greek myth. Yeah, you don't have the exact verse in. in for that um, no, it's um, actually he appears three times in the Odyssey. Once at the end of Book uh, Ten in the middle of book 11 and at the beginning of book 12. So he dies in book 10. He meets Odysseus in the netherworld in book 11, and Odysseus buries his corpse in book 12. And in each case, you can find um, uh, echoes in the Gospel of Mark for this uh, enigmatic character. Wow. That's great stuff. Thank you for that question. And if you go through, you want to get shocked if you're a biblicist type that's all about looking at the gospel comparisons, go check out the differences between the gospels in their end with this issue. It's a young man. It's a young man sitting in the tomb that tells her, oh, he's not here anymore. He's been taken. And, you know, go to Galilee where, where he said he'd meet them before. And the women went and told no one for they were afraid. Compare that to Matthew. Compare that to Luke. It's just that it is clearly not the same. They are not in agreement at all whatsoever. Um, I want to look at this next chat, uh, Neil. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll because... dig more into this next time for sure. This will be good. And my, by the way, my audience has been into this particular passage wondering what the hell is Mark talking about? Why would yeah. he say this? That's what it's about. So we're going to have to get you back on and just do a whole entire video based on this thing. Uh, that here. would be fun. Look, um, I'm doing it soon. I'm going to get you on here soon. It's, it's happening. So breaking news, we're going to do that. That's happening soon. Okay. So, uh, when you get when you get back from your trip, we'll, we'll figure that out. But uh, thank you for that question. There is two more left, and we're out of here. So let's see the next one. Oh, where I know you? you have it up. Why no external evidence of gospel? Oh, it's already up there. Renzo Rodriguez, thank you. Why no external evidence of the gospels? Uh, Renzo, I don't know where you got that information. It's absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Ooh. Papias writing much earlier than Marcion knows of the gospel of Mark, and he knows two gospels of Matthew. One of them probably is the Q document. We have evidence of radiation of the Gospel of Matthew in the um, 
the uh, Apocalypse of John. We have um, radiation of Matthew also in the Johannine epistles. Um, I don't know who gave you that information. Now, we don't have evidence, and we also have four gospel connections, uh, collections, probably before Marcion. So uh, I don't know where you're getting that information. I've heard it before, uh, people saying that. But that is so patently not the case that you have to be careful about where you get that information. Um, what we can say is Marcion may have been the first person to put together a New Testament that consists only of the Gospel of Luke and a, a small connection, a collection of Paul's epistles. So it may be that Marcion is responsible for the earliest New Testament collection. But it's not true that uh, there's no external evidence for the Gospels before Marcion. In fact, my solution to the synoptic problem includes Papias. It's called the Q plus Papias hypothesis. Because Papias uh, is clearly witnessing um, to the Gospels. Um, now, people have said, well, maybe it's not our Gospels. Well, how would we know? Other Gospels yeah. that are attributed to Mark and Matthew, I yeah. just think that that's, um, that's not helpful. But anyway, thank you for your question. I hope this is helpful to you. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, before we get to the last Super Chat, Apollonius says, Amo is definitely wrong on a lot of things. And I know you're referring to what Dr. McDonald just said about the uh, the naked boy. But I don't think that's the case. I think what Dr. McDonald said strengthens Amo's argument. So we might have to dig into that a little bit. Yeah, I don't I don't know the argument, but I would go look at I would get this book that we've been talking about. Yeah. Dive in. There's there's Greek art about this very issue that we have as well as you got to ask yourself the real question. What the heck is this boy doing anyway? So what why is he in the narrative? Like Mark you know, would just randomly write some stuff that doesn't have a meaning. This is man, I'm telling you, Neil, when this course comes out you're going to want to pump this out. It, it is going to go deep. So be on the yeah. lookout and, and get the book. To, just to answer the question, I don't think so. I don't just because if if, it, if it's borrowing from the Odyssey, that doesn't necessarily mean he's wrong about Amon's theory of this being some sort of initiation mystery religion thing. They could be. They could both coexist. But I don't know. We'll, we'll get into that later. That's another topic. I want to get to the last super chat. Paul Schlater, thank you for the super chat. Can we trace ethics in the Gospels back to Jesus? This is the last super chat. I don't know that we have a choice. We could either be entirely agnostic about Jesus and ethics, or we can say that the energy that we find in Paul and in the Gospels about an understanding of the poor and outsiders and liberation and so on it comes from somewhere, and there's an energy that comes out of this uh, movement. I'm not willing to commit to Jesus having said anything that we have in the Gospels. I am willing to commit that there is an ethical horizon that appears in the Q document and then issues in the synoptics, which is congenial to much of what we find in Paul, and by an intermediate allusion in Josephus, which would be a different topic for us. So I think the notion of the kingdom of God as an alternative Jewish ethic is probably back to Jesus. And that's why in the Q document, we have so many alternatives to Jewish law, especially the laws in Deuteronomy. So whereas in, in Deuteronomy, uh, be, um, you know, be holy as God is holy, it becomes be compassionate as God is compassionate. So you have this transformation of Jewish law from holiness and distinctiveness to compassion and inclusiveness. And I dare say that our culture needs to have a healthy dose of inclusiveness. Wow, thank you for that. And um, yeah, that, uh, by the way, what's going on? Backyard Professor, good to see you in the chat. But um, yeah, that was the last super chat. And I just want to, before we go, I just want to remind you there's 150 people watching, get the book. It's This is the final, all of your work for the last 20, 30 years into this. And yeah. it's 
the price of a lot of your books that are for academia purposes are up to a hundred bucks, 90 bucks, but all this stuff you can get right here for a limited time for 1848, the price mm -hmm. dropped only for a short amount of time. We don't know how long it's going to go back up. I just got myself a copy and anything else you want to say about this and the course that's coming up before we get out of here. Thank you so much, Neil. And uh, you and Derek and others like you are really bringing religious conscious, critical religious consciousness to so many people who are questers, who are maybe skeptical of religion, but find that these texts are fascinating and, and uh, emboldening. emboldening. Yes. And I just put the link in the description and pinned to the top. So you guys have no excuse not to find it. It's there. So thank you for that. And I just want to say thank you, Derek, for uh, setting this up. I know you guys have been yeah. busy all day. And well, real, real quick, just, yeah. just to say something about this, Neil, and I think this is important in the spirit of everything that we've been saying. I think it's time we take back this literature. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and I mean, after having this long course with with Dennis and reading from the book, I mean, it is truly. I get. I think this is what Dennis is trying to do and say, and to tell him sometimes you're too nice, you're too polite about it. And in fact, we have a lot of people who are extreme Christian nationalists. We have some really bad kind of enemies when it comes to what they're doing with this book, what they're doing with the religion, what they're doing with this stuff. And we need to take back this this text yeah. and show people. Listen, this is what this literature is really about. This is what this literature is actually saying. This is what the scholarship teaches. Educate people, and maybe we can defang um, the, the bad things that we're seeing going on. Well, I view this as my best weapon for the culture wars. Wow. And I'd like to make it my legacy to say that there's no excuse to be so stupid and mean. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, it's exciting, Neil. How excited do you get? I'm going to use this analogy. How excited do you get when you find out something connects to Bacchus, or you, you find out, oh my God, hold on, Dionysus. This is a direct comparison to Osiris's resurrection, or whatever it might be. It blows your mind. It's fun to find out how humans did this. Not only that, but you, Dennis, make such a good point about how even in today, in 2023, we have we have people who have a lot of influence over our daily lives in politics and they get their ideas from the source of that that is it, it's misunderstood and then applied wrongly and we have people being you know we have abortion laws and women are forced to do certain things and they can't like there's a lot of things that are a direct result right. of people using mythology and weaponizing it that's and right so, yeah. I think this book and the work you do really shows objectively. Look, look at this and look at this. And like, here's the truth right in front of your face. You can either choose to deny it or you can, you know, deal with it. Right. I yeah. mean, it's yeah. in your face. It smacks you so freaking hard. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, love it. The only, it's uh, the only, the only, the only way around it is um, what's the term for people who, take information and just ignore it and only look at the information that they want. Something denied, but plausible deniability. Is that what it is called? Yeah, I guess so. I, yeah, I think that's right. Pla yeah. And that's, that's the only way around it. And so, you know, I'm, that's, I don't know. All right. But uh, this has been great. And like I always say, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.